our message for today. Lord Jesus, I thank you for what you are doing in our church. I thank you for the bittersweet moments like this where we have to see people go. But I thank you, Lord, that you are at work in this world and you're taking people wherever they have to be. I thank you that we can submit to you and follow you and you will take us where we need to be, to love, to care, to serve people. I pray that each one of us would be able to look back on years of faithfulness the way Lynn and Sandy can today. Bless us now as we hear your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So how many of you guys played dress-up when you were young? Is it just me? No. I used to love playing dress-up. You know, I had one favorite person above all persons, and that was John Wayne. I loved watching John Wayne. I would go to my grandma's house, and they had the movie Rio Lobo. I don't know if you've ever watched it. If you haven't, you're missing out. And my brother and I would sit and we would watch it and then rewind it and watch it and rewind it till finally Grandma would get fed up and she'd kick us out the door. And so then we'd get our dress-up clothes on and we'd play Rio Lobo and we'd run around and we'd be all the different characters all at once. And man, we died a lot, you know. We, we won a lot of gunfights, but we lost a few too. We would put on an outfit and become someone else. We could be a policeman or maybe sometimes we'd be a king or a soldier or whatever we wanted to be on that given day. Mostly for me and Ben it was soldiers or cowboys. My mom tried valiantly to say, you know, you could be something peaceful. You could be a farmer or something. <laughs> we'd say, yeah, mom, but there's no battles. And we'd go off and have fun playing, being someone else for a time, using our imagination and putting on a costume can sure make you feel like some other character. Can it? It makes you feel like maybe you're someone different than you were before, but it doesn't actually change who you are. Just because I happened to put on my hat and get my gun belt on did not make me John Wayne. You can tell just by the height difference. But I could feel that way, but I was still me. And sometimes it can be the same for us as Christians, can it be where we think that what we have to do to achieve righteousness is we have to put on some sort of outward act. We have to kind of fake it till we make it, as we used to say in certain circles of the church. Just, just try hard enough and eventually it'll sink into your bones. There was a movement a while ago called the Social Gospel Movement. Have you heard of that? It was a movement that led to the temperance movement in Canada and the U.S. And they decided that the way to bring God's kingdom to earth was to change the outward actions of people by force. We'll make laws against alcohol. We'll make laws against dancing. We'll make laws against all these wicked things that are tearing people's lives down. And indeed, they could make a point and say, you know, some bad things were happening. But their idea was, we'll fix the outside and eventually it'll sink in. Do you think it worked? Well, no, if you know anything about prohibition, it was one of the worst times of decadence and evil that ever happened because sinful people won't stop being sinful just because they put on a new suit of clothes. So how do we live then? If we want to be Christians, how do we change? If we can't just do a bunch of things, follow a bunch of rules, and have that change us, what must we do? Well, we go to Colossians 3 where we've been working through, and we begin with Paul to find this question. Colossians 3, beginning in verse 5. He says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry, on account of... Of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. Now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Don't lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. For here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. But Christ is in all and all. Paul starts us with the reality that each person has a history, and that history starts with sinners needing Christ. 
We are all dead. We are all sinful. We are all failed, flawed, broken people. We have all can look back at our lives and see a trail of destruction and damage, of wrath, malice, anger, bad thoughts, bad deeds, bad actions that have led to hurt in our lives and in others, to a breaking of relationship between us and others and between us and God. And the answer then is not to just try harder, but rather to put to death those things that hold us back. Paul says if you want to walk with Christ, if you are living in Christ, then you have the power to do something that was impossible before. You can take the old person and kill the old person. In fact, it says that if you're a new creation in Christ, the old has passed away and the new has come. You are no longer dead. But Christ has made you alive. You no longer have to dwell and live and act out of those things that tied you down in the past. You can set them completely aside. Well, that sounds like work, Matthew. In a way, it is. (laughs) Christ is doing a work in us. But the place to start is not with following a bunch of rules. Okay, you know, he gives us a bunch of things here. Sexual immorality and impurity. Okay, well, i got to make sure I don't do that. How do I do that? Well, I'm going to try harder. I'm going to work, I'm going to work, I'm going to work. No, because you always fail. Because you're still living out of the old man. Sexual immorality and impurity are things that tie us down, that break our relationships. We look at the natural things that God has given us that are good, and instead of seeing them for the precious gift that they are between us and our spouse, we twist them, we change them, we pervert them, we turn our minds to darkness and to trying to satisfy ourselves at the expense of others. It's a deep harm that's affected our whole world right now. We see passions, this Feelings that drive our decisions and actions, living out of the the moment, living out of whatever feels strongest in us. If maybe I'm feeling like I need that person and I love them so much, then I'm going to live out of my passion for that person. Maybe it's my job. I'm feeling passion to go and do my job. Maybe it's anger. I'm feeling passion about ripping that person's head off. But I'm ruled by my feelings. And this is the way the world is, ruled by feelings, running from one passion to another. The old self lives in that, breathes in that. And Christ says, put it to death because passion, feelings, is uncontrollable and untrustworthy. I like to quote the the famous theologian Whitney Houston (laughs) and say, don't trust your feelings. It's true. Do not trust your feelings. Your feelings can be led astray. As uh, uh, Scrooge said, you know, sometimes what I see might have more of gravy than the grave in it. I might be distracted because I had a bit of a cheese or a bit of bread and it threw my constitution off. Our feelings can be affected by the most minor things. I wake up in the morning and maybe my neck is just a little bit sore because I didn't sleep right and all of a sudden my day's ruined. We can live our whole lives, and indeed, you look at the world right now, and it is driven by passions, by feelings. It is uh, careening from one thing to another. We have to hate this person, destroy this person, seek after this thing, get all we can, feel good enough. And if we don't feel, it must be someone else's fault. If everything's not perfect, it's their fault that's done it, and we have to chase them down and beat them to death to make sure that they never do that again. He goes on and he says, evil desires, actively desiring to do those things that harm, that hurt, that kill us. That's what sin is, this desire in us to go after the very thing that poisons us. And yet we do it all the time as fleshly people. We seek the things that we know are harmful. You've got a problem with the the neighbor and so I'm going to go and fix that. You've got a problem with the person on the other end of the telephone. Well, that lady should have known what she should have known, so I'm going to yell at her until she gets me the right answer. You go for a meal and the waitress wasn't nice enough, and so you you attack them and you don't give them any tip, and you say, you're a bad waitress. Oh, wow, I fixed everything. We desire to get all that we can to fill ourselves up by our own strength. Just like in the Garden of Eden, we look at this fruit that's pleasing to the eye, good to the touch, but in the end that leads to death. We look at this fruit that says you can be God, deciding what is good and evil for yourself, and we say, yes, yes, I want that for me. 
I want to be in charge. I want to have the power. And we descend into evil, into broken relationships, into shattered lives, into hopelessness, and even into death. We go to covetousness, which is idolatry. We seek, we want, we grasp. We look at the other person and we say, you've got a better life, you've got a better wife, you've got a better car, you've got a better this or that or the next thing, and I want it and I deserve it. You ever go on the TV and see all the commercials? They drive me nuts. Just ask my kids. I start yelling at the television. <laughs> it's all about me. You deserve a new truck. You deserve a holiday. You deserve this pair of sunglasses. You deserve, you deserve, you deserve, you, 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 you get it. And we're taught, we're built to covet. We have no contentment. We fall into idolatry. We make something other than Christ the object of our heart, of our worship, of our focus in life. And this is not just out there. <laughs> But this can be us too. As Christians, we can let some of that old self come back to life. We can, uh, my illustration, I think I was telling you last week, is you know, the old man is dead on the floor, but the devil's there with the shock paddles, just giving him a jolt every now and then. And we allow covetousness to take us over. Oh man, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be nice if our church had as nice of a parking lot as that other church that we know of? You know? Wouldn't it be great if, if we could have as many people coming to faith as, as that church because then we'd look really good? We can lose the focus of the mission of God and instead just want the trappings of a good Christian life. We can covet. We can make an idol. And all of that has to be set aside. Anger and wrath. <laughs> This is, this is my wheelhouse of, of struggle, right? Anger. This feeling that rises up that feels so righteous. This powerful force where you can make others bend to your will because they better or they're going to have squalls. This wrath that can fill you and it feels so righteous and good. Well, they did something they shouldn't. And so I'll fix them. And we do that as Christians, don't we? I'm just defending the Lord. I had to attack that person and call them all sorts of names. They said something bad about God. I was defending Him. We live our lives and we allow these things to get hold of us and to destroy people, to destroy relationships, to break down the very fundamentals of who we are in Christ. And it feels so good for a time. Then there's malice, this deep Hatred against someone, this deliberate desire to see someone destroyed. When we look at someone and we say, they're not doing right. They're not doing what is good. And I hope that they experience all the consequences that they deserve for that. I hope they get what's coming to them. And we live our lives hating others. Maybe we feel justified. Some, some people do really evil things. And the world says it's good to hate them. It's good to find that person who's a racist and just hate them and destroy them and seek evil for them. It's good to find the person who's a murderer, an abuser, someone who you can attack, and it's good to have malice against them in your heart because they deserve it. And Christ says, hey, that was you too. You're on this list. You want to hate them? Remember the story. The man who had everything given back to him by the king. The man who had his great debt forgiven. And then he walked out and he grabbed his brother by the neck and he said, pay me what you owe. That's what we do when we live with malice in our heart towards any person. It will destroy us and it will destroy others. It never produces the righteousness of God. And then out of that comes slander, lies, wicked talk. Talk that's deliberately designed to destroy others, to tear down their reputation, to tear down their life, to make others hate them as much as you hate them. You talk behind people's back. You tear them away. You destroy them and you destroy Christ's witness to them in you. It's powerful. Obscene talk, this foulness and lowness of speech, hasn't this taken over our world? A politician wants to sound cool, so what do they do? They drop a swear word into their speech, and that makes them sound connected. You have people who talk of the foulest things as a regular part of their day. And we look and we, we see that with shock, but 
Can't we be drawn into the same kind of thing? Coarse joking, false ideas of what's funny. We can live our lives obscenely. And finally, lies. Lies have such power. And they're a great evil. And we don't just lie with our mouth. We don't just lie to one another. But we can lie with our life. We can say, Jesus is Lord. How many have said that? And then we can make ourselves Lord in the way that we act or live. We can say, Jesus is Lord. But then when the trouble time comes, we pull back the control and we say, you know what? I've got this for a while. You take a powder God. We can lie and we can say, I love you with the love of the Lord, when really in my heart there is less than love. We can lie with our lives and say, everything in me is devoted to Christ, but there's something that I've held back. There's something that stops me. There's something that I keep safely for myself because I don't know if God's trustworthy enough. Maybe it's my kids. Maybe it's my home. Maybe it's my job. Who knows what it may be? But we lie to each other and to God, even as believers. And Paul says, put to death all these things. In the power of the Spirit, because of all that he said before, because of who you are in Christ, because of what he's done in you, because of the power that's alive in you in the Holy Spirit, put these things to death. Not tomorrow, not in a week, but now. You say you walk with Christ, do it. You know, have you ever had a really moldy house? I've dealt with a couple of my days as a renovator. Have you ever seen that? Where there's mold climbing up the walls and when there's this smell and people who live in there, it just will cause them to have health problems and pain and suffering. It can be hidden away. It can kind of be behind the scenes. Sometimes you can even go in with a fresh can of paint and paint all the walls and say, hey, look, it's shiny, it's white, it's clean. But that mold is still there eating away and it's still there affecting anybody that goes into the building. This is what happens when we try to paper over the areas where the Lord is saying, fix that, change that, do this. Put to death the things of the flesh. Live in Christ. If we just try to paper it over and pretend it's not there, we die and we cause death in others. But if we surrender to Christ, if we recognize, I can't do this on my own. I need you every step of the way. I need your spirit to change my heart, to do what is impossible for me to do myself, to take this new creation and make me alive. Then I can put these things to death. All this list of things tears others down, destroys relationship, sows the seeds of bitterness and of sadness in our own lives. We make ourselves into tormented tormentors. We make ourselves into the kind of person who is hell for others. And Christ says, be free. Turn away from these things. Put them to death. Confirm that these things are not still part of our lives as new creations in Christ. But is Christianity all a list of don'ts? Is that just what it is? Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. I think I told you that's the way that a new believer in the Serb church gets inducted, is all the things you can't do now. That's not what it's about. Christ does say these things aren't okay. And you can't do them and look yourself in the mirror and say, I'm right with God. But he says, I'm going to help you to get rid of them. And then here's what I want you to do. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy, beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful as God's chosen ones. This is a profound statement. Each of us is chosen by God. We are His. He likes us. He meant for us to walk with Him. He didn't just say, well, you know, I've got a quota to fill today. I guess you'll do. 
He actually cared enough that He chose us, that He died on the cross for us, for each of our individual sins. He made us alive. He gave us a way to walk with Him no matter what. He filled us with His Spirit. He says, you're one of mine. And He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. I was telling someone a little while ago, that's a promise and a threat. He's coming for you. So if you think that the man who began a good work in you, this man Jesus who started you on this road of faith, is going to give you up just because you decide maybe you want to take a break, you got another thing coming. He's going to do his work in you, amen? amen? Hallelujah, let's get a little Baptist. He actually chose you, wants you, cares for you, and has a purpose for you. You are chosen by God, meant to be His children. Perfect precision instruments used by God to do His work in this world, filled with His Spirit. And you know what else? You're holy, set apart by God, made into something perfect. He is doing the work to dung out all the stuff, all the pain, all the suffering, all the wrong choices, wrong ideas, wrong dreams that have been overwhelming us all these years. He is taking them away and replacing them with newness of life, with sanctification, with holiness. You know, holiness, this set-apart idea, every instrument in the tabernacle was holy. They were set apart and they only had one use. The fork that they used to grab the meat out of the sacrifice was not used as a regular barbecue fork on every other day of the week. It was set apart for one purpose, the service of the Lord. And when God says you are holy, it means you are set apart for one purpose. You're not a baker or an oil worker or whatever else you do. You are God's instrument, God's minister, God's servant in this world. Yes, you have a job. Yes, you have things that you do. But the reason He called you was to show His gospel in this world, to minister His light, to be His hands and feet and voice in the world. Isn't that cool? Isn't that awesome? I mean, I know me, and I'm kind of stupid sometimes. And God chose me, and God uses me. Isn't that amazing? And He does it with all of us. <coughs> Excuse me. And we are beloved. Christ doesn't just tolerate us. And he doesn't look at us and say, well, I couldn't get anybody better. He loves us. He loves us more than those of us who are married can love our spouses. I mean, I look at my wife and she's so perfect and so wonderful and so awesome and I just love her. And I think, my love for my wife can't hold a candle to the love that Christ has for me. He loves us that much. It's not just that he is going to tolerate us or he kind of loves us. Or, you know, it's like your third cousin once removed that you saw one time and you're like, well, I guess you're blood, so I have to tolerate you. He loves us. We are his beloved people. And because of that, we're called to put on compassionate hearts, caring for others, looking at the world around us, not for how it affects us, but for how we can affect the world through Christ. We're called to see those who are in pain and suffering, those who are experiencing the burden and the lostness that comes in sin, and we're called to have our hearts cry out for them, to call them, to search for them, to seek them, and to love them in the way Christ loves them, because we know the pain of sin, because we know the, the horror of broken relationships. We're not called to look at people and say, oh, I can't believe that they're like that. I don't, or they don't deserve my love. We're called to look at them and say, how can I care for them? Because, man, they must be hurting. And guess what? The worse they are, the more they need us. The worse they are, the more we have to love them. It's really easy to love some people, right? The scriptures say that. But Christ says, love your enemies. Love the worst. Find those people that everybody else has rejected. The tax collectors, the sinners, the prostitutes, and love them. Because guess what? Love's in short supply in their life. Be compassionate. Be kind and tender to them. Have humility and meekness. Realize that we aren't as important as other people. Make yourself less than other people. Value others more than yourself. Put them up and say, it doesn't matter. I can decrease. Let Christ increase and let other people be more important than me. 
oh, that hurts. Because <laughs> I'm sure I'm the most important person in the world most days. And yet we're called to be humble, to be meek, to be like Christ, to focus on God and to realize that He is the most important and that what He has made matters. And finally, we're, we're called to put on patience. Oh, the opposite of anger and wrath and malice. Patience is possible when we trust and know God because patience says, no matter what happens, God's in control and I can rest in Him. I can wait. I can trust. I know that He's not going to let me down. Why would He? Is that old Mid-South Boys song I might have told you about where it says, He didn't lift me up to let me down. He didn't lift me out of the sinking sand to place me on shaky ground. Why would God save us and then say, well, now you're going to spend the rest of your life wandering from trouble to trouble, and I hope you do well because I'm not going to be there. No, he says in this world you will have trouble, but I leave you my peace. Those who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Those who uh, live in this world will have to count it all joy because they will experience trials and tribulations so that they can grow in perseverance, so they can learn to walk with God the way they're intended. And guess what? You think this one's bad? Wait for the next one. <laughs> trust is built by one trial after the next growing and producing patience and perseverance in us it's really exciting when we're building houses isn't it bearing with one another forgiving one another being willing to excuse to overlook the sins, the problems, the pains that others have committed in our lives, to look at someone who's done something so bad and say, you know what? God did something good in me, so how can I hold anything against anyone? While I was an enemy of God, He saved me, so how can I look at my enemy and not forgive and love them? And above all, we have to put on love. Love really is powerful. When someone hates you and you love them, just watch as the hate melts away. When the love is not something I'm doing because I have to, because Jesus said I had to love you, but when we truly understand that each person in this world is created in the image of God, is valued by God, is more important than I am because God has called me to love them, then I'm able to care for them the way I should, to love them, to value them, to give myself for them as I should, above all put on love because love binds people together. Love for God and love for each other makes dirty humans into wonderful holy beings. When we live in love, when we let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, then we have the power to change this world. Not because we're doing something, but because God in us is doing something. Just like that last song that we sang said, yet not I, but through Christ in me. I can say all is mine. Not because I'm working hard, not because I'm doing enough, not because I've managed to follow the right set of rules and fake it till I make it, but because Christ in me is flowing out of me as quick as he can and I can't stop him. That's what he does in us. And so we can be thankful we can look around this world and instead of seeing the problems, the pains, the struggles, we can count our blessings. Just like Neil had us do, we can say, look how thankful I am for all the things that God has done. We can stop and instead of seeing the trouble, we can see the faithfulness of God. All my life you have been faithful. This is a testimony that all of us, when we stop and look at God, we can say is true. Even when I wasn't faithful, even when I walked away from the Lord, when I tried to be unfaithful to God, He maintained His faithfulness to me in calling me back to Himself. He is faithful, and we can be thankful in Him. So these new things we put on by the power of the Spirit, and they make a new person of the old, and all that made us who we are before Christ gets stripped away. And all that He is becomes ours. Now, do we do it by our own strength? Well, He goes on and He says, 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching, admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. If we want to grow, if we want to live the life of Christ, we need to soak in the Word. We need to let the Word of Christ dwell in us. We need to know God. You know, so many of us, unfortunately, live our lives with this thing as a wonderful prop tucked under our arms. Man, I'm having so much trouble. I wonder how I'm going to overcome that. Man, I wish I knew the answer to all the problems. Well, guess what? God has actually revealed himself to us in this book. God has showed us the way we can live, not just to limp along, barely able to get by, praying that we can someday make it to the finish line, but to live in freedom, in confidence, in the glory that God has in us and through us. We can run the race, not limp along, because Christ is doing something in us. That comes from soaking in the Scriptures, teaching, admonishing each other, taking the time to talk about Christ and to share Christ, taking time to listen. Ooh, hate that one. <laughs> taking time to submit to people, to ask people, how am I doing? Is there something that needs to change in me? And being willing to hear. You know, that was one of the hardest things I ever had to learn. I was a young and very sure person, quite rebellious too. And I had my friend Doc, I think I've told you, sit me down in a chair, tell me all sorts of wonderful things about me, and then say, Matthew, you're rebellious. Change or leave. And guess what? I, leave. I, I changed, rather. I was able to see for the first time that I had problems in me that wasn't the cause of other people. That it was actually me that needed to change. And I heard because someone told me, we need that in our lives. None of us is such a good Christian that we don't need someone to speak into our lives to help us to see something that we might have missed. We all wander around kind of like this, <laughs> a little bit blind, and we need someone else to speak into our lives. That's why Christ said the little parable about the person who wants to go and fix the speck in someone else's eye. Hey, first, take care of that big plank that you're missing, and then maybe you'll have the love, the care, the compassion, the concern to help that person get the dust out of their eye correctly. We all need the humility to realize that we need the church. That's why I preach every week, you know. It's not just so I can hear my beautiful, melodious voice. But I want to help you guys to know the truth of the scriptures. I want you to see something that I need to see. I spend more time reading this than, than you guys get to. I spend more time wrestling over the passage than you two. And you know what's the first thing the Holy Spirit always does? Hey, Matthew, that's for you today. Oh, darn it. We need the scriptures. And we don't just need this. We need to admonish each other, to encourage each other, to lift each other up, to share scripture, to pray for each other, to sing songs, hymns, spiritual songs, to encourage and lift each other up as the body. Because on one day, I'm going to be weak and struggling. And the next, you're going to be weak and struggling. And together, we move forward as the body of Christ. We have to do this with thankfulness in our heart to God, stopping, remembering all the ways that God has blessed us. There's that old song, Count Your Blessings. You remember that one? Count your blessings, name them one by one. What a wonderful song. And it's a simple song. But how often do we forget that? Hey, when you're in trouble, stop and look around and realize that maybe things aren't as bad as you thought. And whatever you do in word or in deed... Do in the name, in the power, in the authority of Christ. Giving thanks to God. We need to live our lives devoted to Christ. In the power and the strength of Christ. And that demands us submitting to Christ. Changing the way we would live before. Killing the old person that keeps trying to hop up and get back to life. When we're filled with the Spirit and we take time to know God through His revelation, the Scriptures, we're able to truly grow. And from this growth comes thankfulness, joy, fellowship, 
and everything else that we need in the Christian life. All the fruit of the Spirit comes as we walk with Christ. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, kindness, and self-control. Against these things there is no law. And we can experience them fully in Christ. Put to death the flesh. Put on righteousness and walk in Jesus' strength. This is the call for us today. The Christian life involves surrendering the old and the dead life of the flesh. Taking on the full and the joyful life of the new creation that we are in Christ. Not someday we'll be, but are. As we walk with Christ, as we tr truly do all things in the name and the power of Christ, we find a whole new way of living, a new way to relate to the world. We go from self-serving, self-centered people to ministers of the love and the peace of Christ in this world. The distinctions that separated us before, the things that blocked us, the hatred and anger passes away instead of Jew and Greek, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. We are all with Christ. He is all and in all for us. No longer is the hated enemy, the unbeliever out there and us believers in here. No longer is there separations and distinctions of denomination. No longer is there anything but children of God. And we have the power, the ability, the strength and the spirit to walk with Him and to impact this world. Christ is the center and the fountain of all we are and what He has done can make us truly thankful every day. Amen? Amen. So CCF, here comes the, the hard part. Is Christ all and in all for each one of us? Have we truly put aside those things that are tying us down and holding us back? Today, are there things that are blocking us from living the life of Christ from ministering the gospel fully around us? Have we allowed little bits of lies to trickle into our heads and to take over? Have we believed that we can do a better job than God? Are we living and letting the world, word dwell in us and the Spirit work through us? Are we singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual psalms, encouraging each other, lifting each other up before the throne in prayer? And above all, are we doing everything in the name, in the power, in the authority of Jesus as we give thanks for the wonderful freedom we have in Christ? What do you figure? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for this hard message for me. I thank you for the way that you are at work in us. I ask that we would be able to fully put off the old self. I pray that we would turn away from lies and deception, from false ways of living. I pray that we would recognize who we were and who you've made us to be. And I pray in the power of the Spirit that you would change our hearts and our lives to evermore be closer to you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.